All right, good morning, everybody. On my way to work, I'm going to go away to Chasna tonight, Messiah Kedushin in Lakewood. If anybody's in Lakewood today wants to say hi, I have a few minutes to, to kill. Um, probably going to be in the area maybe an hour early uh, before the Chasna. So that'll, you know, if anybody wants to say hi. Not sure what I want to talk about today. A few things on my mind, but not not much to talk about. I'm frustrated with a lot of things going on, and I shouldn't be. And I'm trying to, you know, deal with my coping mechanisms. And I, what I find that I I have been failing recently a lot dealing with my coping mechanisms. Uh, using my coping mechanisms hasn't been really going my way and that's okay <laughs> because that's why we have coping mechanisms to help us learn that that God is in control and I'm kind of all over the place and really is the message of show of it really these six weeks that we're in the middle of right now is to properly have our coping mechanisms you know we're in the third week now of show of it so we're you know we're almost halfway through entering Chodesh Shvat which is my birthday is Chodesh Shvat and tomorrow tonight Rish Chodesh Shvat is a Rosh Hashanah Le'ilan Kedivar Beis Shammai. The significance of what that means that we have the new year for the trees according to the opinion of Beis And the difference that two weeks later we have the new year for the trees according to the opinion of Beis Hillel. The dichotomy that we have there, of course, the halacha is like Beis Hillel. We have Beis Shammai also. We have the Shtikol Rosh Hashanah tonight and tomorrow. Now, obviously, we understand halachically the whole idea of Rosh Hashanah Le'ilan is simply that it's about Meiser of Paris uh, and, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a legal issue it's not the spirituality that we've developed in the past let's say five, six hundred years around practices of, of, of Tuvishma which are actually quite controversial, to be honest. Even though I do, you know, eat pears on Chalisha on Osir Shvat, it's not so simple that we're even allowed to do something like this, uh, let alone the way we do it, the way we conduct ourselves with this. It's not so simple. There's a lot of problems, a lot of issues, but we do it, and I do it. Facing also Chmisha uh, Sibeshvat, mark a year on the Hebrew calendar for what uh, my father left this world. What this year has been like what it means to essentially be the patriarch of my family. remember when my grandfather died that my father mentioned that being the patriarch of the family but also what it means that my only father now is my father in heaven and I don't mean my earthly father in heaven but, my, but our, our father in heaven our Father, our King. And 
how we deal with things like that and what that means. Reflecting back on how I've worked for my father, I mean, all of these issues. Complicated, complicated things. And what this all has to do is show you that Tat, show you that the Tubishvat, how some of the Sifre Kabbalah, although I've heard that it's, it's again, it's, it's questionable and problematic. But how the tikkun of Shoivavim on Chemish Osir is by not fasting, whereas on other days it is by fasting. Today is Erev Rishchodesh, Yom Kippur Kota. So we go from a, 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 a shtickle Yom Kippur to a shtickle Rosh Hashanah. What does all that mean? And in a certain sense, I want to talk about that the Indian of Erev Rosh Chodesh of Yom Kippur Kata. And, and, and the Sefer from my holy answer, the Sefer, the Chabos Yair, he brings from his father a tefillah, very beautiful tefillah, that I I don't always say every every Shkodesh, but I try to when I can. To reflect on what kind of gifts we have in life and what the previous month meant and the coming month means. It doesn't really discuss the month, it discusses life in general. It discusses what it means to be a rabbi and the responsibilities we have as, as Rabbonim. It also discusses what it means to be a father and a husband. And the tender, beautiful prayers that Moshe Shamsh and Bokrach, the, the Rav of Erms, wrote about his son and his daughters and his wife How precious these and, and caring and loving these prayers are. You know, we're we're so. This is something else I want to discuss in general. Something that's been on my mind. How many things we are taught? Yeah, you know, we talk about mythos and logos. We've discussed this many times on, on, on this on this channel. And while we discuss myth generally here in a positive way and as an informative truth, we also have to recognize myth as myth and how myths form and how certain myths are negative and how to distinguish using wisdom between a positive myth and a negative myth and even in the neg negative myths, what kind of positivity there can be there. You know, we... And, and the balance between the two. You know, so much of what we are influenced in our world. So much of it that comes from popular culture that's not really real. You know, we have this fiddler of the roof vision of what Jewish life was like in Europe. What does it mean? Is there such a concept as romance? in a Torah aspect and the truth is you read from a, a godo like the Chavus Yair and like his father at Moshe Shamshin you find
find things that are very romantic. Somewhat shockingly so, when we get this vision of what life was like in Europe, in Germany in the 1600s, which really, Germany in the 1600s is not that much different than Hungary in the 18 and 1900s. In a certain sense, I believe that that Ashkenazi spirit left Germany in the 1600s. Um, and in a certain sense, the Eastern European Hasidim had that follow them, and it did not stay in Germany. To a certain extent, certain aspects did, but certain aspects of, you know, essentially what you had in Hungary and Galicia preserved what there was in, in Germany and in Moravia and in, uh, in Bohemia earlier in the 1500s and 1600s. And that gets to a different subject which I plan to be lecturing about, but you're not going to get the lecture here. You want to sign up and uh, have access to that. We can, I can let you know, you know where to find it. It's not a typical Hamish place. And that's part of my frustrations that I began talking about this morning is I have to make these videos for the lectures. I can't make them in a car like this. I have to find a proper place to sit down and make these videos. And I'm having a very hard time. I don't have like how when I was the Rav in Richmond, first I had one Bismedrish. I had the, the, the town shul where I was the Rav and I could make videos there. And I didn't have as good equipment as I have now. And then, um, even when I didn't, I had a room in my house that was a Bismedrish, and now that, you know, the uh, Daran Koydish, the Sefer Torah, is in my living room, but it doesn't look like a Bismedrish, you know, the way that I had in, uh, in Richmond, and uh, so, and, and the shul where I, where I daven, I don't really have access to go in there, stop, when I feel like it. So it's, uh, it's frustrating. I don't have a quiet place to sit down and make make these videos. I'm getting paid to do it. I, and I promised I would do I'm supposed to make 12 videos. I, I signed the contract in December. And now it's almost February. And my deadline is March 1st. And it's, uh, it's scary because I feel like I'm, I'm not going to do it. And I, and I promise to do it and I, I, I have to stay by my word so I'm, I'm very nervous about this maybe today I'll have some time but again now I you know I, going all the way originally I, I thought I was going to have the Siddur Kedushin somewhere local and now I have to schlep all the way to Lakewood it's a, but it's all in the Shemayim because I'm, I know I'm doing a big mitzvah this I'm not really doing for money the way I usually do the weddings, you know, I, I, it's, I'm getting a little bit of money, but it's Mamish L'Shem Mitzvah, and, and I hope the schus of this, of this Simcha, it's with Beistein, that we should be able to, to, uh, to accomplish everything we have to do, but uh, the lecture that I'm planning to give a whole series of lectures, a master class on the history of Hasidic Judaism, and uh, I specifically signed that I'm not going to post it on YouTube, and I'm getting paid twice as much because I'm not posting on YouTube, um, which this could be a positive thing for them, that I'm advertising it here, and if, I, I don't want to say specifically which website it is, but if someone wants to contact me privately, it costs money, it's not, it's not cheap. And I'm not making the bulk of the money. I should, you know, have certain videos maybe behind a firewall that you can, you know, that can be for our Yechide Segula, you know. 
uh, like Rabbi Bart Sadok does, you know, he charges, you know, fifty dollars a month and he has classes that are not for everybody and I, I, I can't afford that, I know, but uh, and I know I feel bad that I do on the other hand if if I'm helping, you know, those who are helping me out, uh, by advertising a little bit, people can contact me privately about this, and I'm going to try to make those, and that's the other thing, is my videos recently haven't been very good, and that's kind of frustrating, because I know I have to make these really good, you know, I really have to make them professional, and I feel like I'm, there's something holding me back. all this being said to discuss <coughs> some things. One of my rebbeim, Rabbi Jeff Siegel, who's a tzaddik nister, I believe his mom is one of the gedolei ador. Uh, so few people like him in our world uh, and, and in history. He's really a, a unique individual who uh, most people don't really know. But the people who know him know that he is he's incredible really incredible rabbi, and Rabbi Siegel um, kept suggesting that I read a book by uh, Moshe Roseman from bar Ilan University on the historical Baal Shem Tov, and, it, you know, the, the way that so many historians have compared the Baal Shem Tov and the Hav de Loisoreish, but the same thing, there's, you know, this scholarly pursuit of a historical Jesus, but the, there's a big difference, because the historical Jesus is not a historical Jesus. It's a historical look at what, you know, base, it's it, 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 basing on what they can find. You know, it's not directly connected to him that much, whereas this that, that Professor Roseman is doing, which is unique, and perhaps uh, it, it, it's it, it's perhaps unique. It's it's dim, it's unusual and perhaps unique of uh, the search for the historical Baal Shem Tov. One thing that I was amazed by that an actual historical record of the Baal Shem Tov in in the uh, Polish. Uh, record of tax exemptions it was uh, where it said Balshem doctor in Polish that apparently the Baal Shem Tov called himself the Baal Shem, and sometimes the Baal Shem Tov, and he was listed as the doctor in Polish records for his uh, for his tax exemption, for his tax exemption, and that and that the uh, and that the Baal Shem Tov had a tax exemption. And the history behind that, you know, we think about these things and we don't realize. You know how, how traditional and historical these things go back, and really they go back. You know, one of my rebbe pointed out in high school it goes back to to, to Mitzrayim, to Yosef Tzaddik, the idea of, of clergy having tax exemption, and it, and it probably goes back earlier than Yosef Tzaddik as well. So. Um, all these things are really, really fascinating because we, we think of the Baal Shem Tov as being this ethereal figure that, you know, we can't, you know, I mean, I was at his grave, you know, but, like, we, there's so little that we have about the Baal Shem Tov. And to see something like this, and that he used the title doctor also is very it's amazing um, 
I don't know what the context of this title doctor was, was that he was a because he was a faith healer and he was also an herbalist. And so I I don't believe that it's meant here that he was a doctor of divinity as much as that he was a physician. Um you know, alternative healer. But he had the title doctor. Um which is fascinating also because the uh, it sheds some light on something Rabbi Nachman wrote. Because uh, Rabbi Nachman wrote that if someone says that going to if a doctor says he uses he writes in Yiddish doctor and he says if a doctor says that going to the mikveh hmm, I'm gonna wait till this guy goes that going to the mikveh is is unhealthy. It says, Eno Dr. Klal. He's not a doctor at all. And I and I think he's recognizing his great-grandfather, Baal Shem Kaddish, had a title doctor. And I'm wondering if Rebbe Nachman was aware of that. Um, now this book, I was not able to find the entirety of the book. But a great deal of it is on uh, is on Google Books. You know this search for the historical Baal Shem Tov, and uh, you know we wonder. You know La Havdil, you know Aisu Ish had people. You know one in particular on the road to Damascus who never met him and really created the movement. I mean this is one thing that that Professor Rosman is is really suggesting is that the Baal Shem Tov did not create the Hasidic movement. He did not intend in any way to start a movement. And so we have the same question about the um, you know, but then you know, the, the Magid really essentially started the Hasidic movement as a movement recognizes the movement, but then the the uh, question of the pre-Hasidic Hasidim you know, there are those who trace the modern Hasidic movement in certain ways to to my holy ancestor Maral Prague, but also in a certain sense to the Hasidic Ashkenaz much earlier hundreds of years earlier I mean, you look at at uh, the Shira Yichud. That's a as a theology lesson. Uh, in in verse, and how valuable the Shira Yichud is. You know, and how few people really look at it. You know, we by a from Inz and Sakmer Fleckman. We read it during Sphira, each Shabbos of Sphira, and also in uh, uh, on the night of Yom Kippur. The night of Yom Kippur, I have a hard time with it, you know, making it through the whole thing. But even I've seen, you know, secular or non-Jewish, not secular, but non-Jewish sources being amazed by the beauty of the Shira Yichud, you know, uh, uh, Karen Armstrong writes about the, the Shira Yichud, and, uh, in, in her books, and quotes from it, and, you know, the truth is that that's, you know, a lesson in, in Jewish theology, so... All right. But it's fascinating because in a similar way you have the same pattern of somebody who was not, you know, somebody else getting the credit for starting a movement when it was really their student. But in this case it was actually at least a... The Magid was actually a student of the
the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh. He didn't, he didn't have some kind of a revelation uh, on the road to Damascus. Uh, but there were others who didn't meet the Baal Shem Tov who really had this movement uh, the way that we have it today, you know, in a certain way. Um, and how quickly the movement split into many different movements. All of this is very fascinating. So, we're going to talk a little bit about that in that lecture. So maybe you might want to join us. Um, we'll advertise a little bit. So, excuse me. Thank you for watching. God bless. Please like, share, and subscribe. Comment. We'll see you later. Take care.